morning guys, Mark Farashi, Protech Dog Training. I'm on the freeway heading to Hollywood today. I guess there's a big event. The president's in town, vice president's must be doing some speeches and everything, so it's gonna be a madhouse. And uh, my customer lives right around where Kamala Harris's place is at. And they were there last weekend with more highway patrols I've ever seen in my life. Keep in mind they're the state police, so they're they're given the responsibility of helping to protect the vice president, right? And uh, they were there last week. It was like Kamala Harris was home. And then I started to think about, no, it wasn't. They had the whole week ahead of time. Their whole entourage was a whole week. And they set up all their security and they figured out exactly how they're going to do things to get them in and out of that event in the safest way possible. And then I heard a little scuttlebutt yesterday on the internet that there was some kind of big threat coming in. But I'm sure there always is. And... Uh, our people are professionals and the law enforcement are very professional, and so I'm not too worried about it, though there was some, um, some scuttlebutt that you know, might want to stay away from L.A., and I'm sure that was kind of, in a way, planned. They can calm down how many people are there and kind of get a lot of people to just leave town a little early, maybe on a Thursday, and not be in town with all this hubbub, then they're, they've got their drum a little bit tighter, right? doing their job to protect the president and the vice president so but i'm driving right into it my customer's house is right close to there so but it is what it is it's part of living in la so here we go into the rat race of la in the middle of a major situation so we'll find out i should be able to get right in and out because i've already got it kind of mapped out for myself i know exactly last time i ran right into all the roadblocks and the, the traffic people waving you in and out and things were real tight because you're in these neighborhoods that are you know it's where all the uh, the affluence is at which is all good and so you know they've got their lifestyles so uh, we'll get in there and give draco's owners a lesson that's kind of what i wanted to talk about today so the first thing i do personally the way i handle my clients is i give a demo when i bring the dog back show the customers what the dog's doing and, and i've done a good job the dog's working like a top draco did pretty good he was working pretty pretty well and you get the first reaction with the customers. Their jaw drops and they go, wow, because it feels like it's a different dog, right? Reality and truth. The dog's still the same dog. He's got a lot of respect for me and he understands the conditioning that I've built up. And he respects me as the, the pack leader in regards to our relationship, me and his, right? But the first thing Draco did was want to go right back into the same old behaviors with them. And keep in mind that um, you've got this, this case in general and in a lot of cases are like this, is it's an imbalance in relationship, right? Uh, they don't have a proper relationship with the dog, and the dog's walking all over the top of them, and then the dog starts wanting to be the pack leader, and that's not a good dynamic because most dogs will end up uh, making bad choices, right? And then they end up trying to be territorially aggressive and everything else, and, and when they're doing that, they become a liability, and then that's not a good relationship between them. The, the owners, which is the human that should be the pack leader, right? Not the dog. It's an old saying in dog training. You treat a dog like a human, and he's going to treat you like a dog. That's very true, okay? So that being the case, that's kind of the dynamic we had going on, you know? It's, and, and it's not the folks' fault. It's just, it's just human nature to, you know, a lot of people treat a dog like a human, you know? And they, uh, what's that little, all the sayings with it, the rescue, you know, my little fur baby, and they humanize the animal, and that's the worst thing you can do. The dog is still a dog, he's still an animal. And if you fulfill his psychological needs and treat him like he's, he's gonna be a lot more happy, a lot more balanced, and a lot more uh, mentally balanced and mentally uh, stable, right? And that's what we need in our society, and that fulfills the dog's psychological needs. When I was hanging out with Caesar years ago, he had his own little thing, he still does, very homopathic in how he, he does things. He's, not so much of a heel sit down stay as he is about teaching people to understand their energy and what they put out, what they expect of the dog, and how to fulfill that dog's psychological needs. And in that regards, it was all about his whole formula, which is fulfilling the dog's psychological needs go around a certain perspective, and that includes travel with the pack, right? He would go out, we would go out every day, we'd go out to the, to the, to the hills, and we'd go to the river, and we'd go, we'd go places with a pack. And we would fulfill that psychological need to travel, to go with a pack, with a pack leader. You always see him walking, and he makes the dog stay behind him. That's part of fulfilling the dog's psychological needs, following the pack leader. 
right? And so this is only one thing in a myriad of little things to overall fulfill the dog's psychological needs, right? So when you have a relationship with your dog, you want to be kind of in that same vein. You do it different ways. You don't have to do it like Caesar does. There's a lot of it's, but it's all about it comes down to how you treat the animal, right? And what you expect of them and how you treat them. And if you do the right things in that whole flow of your lifestyle in relationship to your pack leadership and being a, uh, a strong pack leader, and uh, as Caesar always saying, calm and assertive, right? You'll go a lot farther in that in that relationship with the dog. So travel is one of those things. Food, eating, the whole routine of putting the food bowl down and controlling that pack that you see Caesar do. Same thing, right? Um, a lot of what I did with Draco was what we call impulse control. Because Draco wanted to do everything on his own and they were trying to control this Tasmanian devil, not understanding these things. And the dog was always trying to take lead. And that's an improper relationship. So now, we're today, we're going to go over this with them today, whereas then we kind of already did when we dropped them off and did our, our drop-off. Um, is accent again what impulse control is all about and that you make him wait at the doors. You make him wait at the tailgate or the door of the car and you make him wait to be go in and when you get done and you want to come home and you open that door, you don't just let him jump out. You say nope and you lock him with the door and you make him wait. And then you say his name, Draco. Good, Draco. Yep. Then he's allowed to get out, right? So there's a lot of contextual impulse control that's been built in with the conditioning. There's a reason for that. It's not just having control over the animal. It's about what you're doing to set mental parameters on the animal that fulfill his psychological aspects of the animal. He's a dog, right? And when you do that, you fulfill his psychological needs, and now he becomes very happy. He's, he's, got, he's in tune with you and the family, and now he starts to really become a functional animal in your lifestyle, right? And that's what these folks want, and that's what most of my customers all want. You know, the dogs usually got some kind of a problem based on how they're treating the animal, but conditioning the dog to have functional obedience and what we do is all part of it, but it's not a heel, sit down, stay. There's more that goes on in that, right? It's what we do within our routine that we set these perimeters in, right? Impulse control is a big part of that, right? It allows you to be the one that's the alpha, and then you dictate when the dog gets to break and when he gets to go in the door. And so now you always have that contextual uh, alpha wolf type thing. Doesn't mean you need to beat him up. You don't need to be abusive. You don't need. To be, you know, you hear people talking about dominance. Well, dominance is, is is very subtle. It doesn't need to be where you do these alpha rolls and put the dog in his back. You don't need that. You just need to have a functional pattern in how you do things that fulfill the dog's psychological needs and put you in the control of the animal and you are now the alpha wolf, right? That's all it is, right? So um, that's kind of my highlight point that I wanted to put out as I start my drive to, to Hollywood, the ritzy part of town, and um, go over that with you because I'm going to be going over it with a customer today. This is their first lesson. I'll be giving them about five lessons overall. And the other thing, let's go ahead and talk about that. We started to break him into the stem collar. You remember a couple of videos I did about me breaking him into the stem collar? Well, I didn't finish the last turnoff. I want three turnoffs, and I don't feel that we've conveyed the thought to the dog, right? Overall, about what the stem collar is about, giving the power to the dog so he understands that he's the one turning off the collar when he complies with something he already knows. And once the dog starts to understand that, I can start to grow the dog and expand on how I use the collar. But I can't do it until the dog understands the whole concept of the collar. Now these folks want it, they have a collar already, they want to put this into their routine. Why? Because they probably feel a little bit hampered with lack of control and they don't have confidence in working with the animal. But here's the point, I've said it before, the tool is only as good as the person using it. It's not the tool, it's not just a button. It's a matter of understanding the psychology of how we condition an animal and the, the whole thing of uh, classical conditioning, operant conditioning. You should have that understanding under your belt before you end up going to a stem collar, is my personal opinion, right? So I really am hesitant to say, okay, here's the collar, go ahead and give them a lesson today on how to use the collar. I'm gonna overview it, we're gonna talk about it. I've got them charging it up today and I'm gonna try to do the, the last turn on it. We'll do it today and see how he does, right? But I really don't want them to put that collar on the dog yet and start, okay, because they don't have enough ability to understand how we condition the animal or what it's all about. I'd rather have them have the dog on a leash and 
do things that way and struggle towards learning motor movements and leash control and timing and all the things that they need to learn first. And it's hard for a customer because especially ones like these, they have a busy lifestyle, they've got all things they're doing, and they're trying to juggle this one aspect of getting their dog trained and having to do all the work that it takes to, to get to that level, getting off the couch and putting the hard work in. A lot of times it's hard for people. They, um, they want this and they have a certain perception, a certain perspective of what this means. And so they want a trained dog. But they, they got to come to the realization that with that comes them getting off the couch and putting the hard work in. It's not a robot, right? It's not just like putting a, a bolt in the machinery and saying, okay, it's fixed and you can drive down, down the road. It doesn't work that way. It's a relationship. The dog is an emotional creature that needs to understand and have a, a relationship and respect with you. Okay, And everybody in the pack is going to be respected a little differently. One person might have the dog's total control and have a lot more respect because he's doing things the right way. He's more of a uh, has more assertive, assertive and calm nature. Another person might not have that same and to be lacking in those areas. And the dog doesn't. So there's a hierarchy. Dogs are always going after the hierarchy in the pack. You hear about that all the time. So the dog individually, as the dog, he respects each person as an individual. Okay. So that's just the way it works. So that person maybe that's uh, the weakest in that regard needs to work all the harder to be able to bring themselves up to a level that the dog respects. And that means they've got to work harder, right? So, all right, let me get out of here before this thing shuts off. I'm starting to have a clogged memory problem again. And it's very likely going to shut off and I'll lose my feet. So I thank you very much, Mark Farashi, Protect Dog Training. <clears throat> Heading into Hollywood to uh, work with Draco and the customers there. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.